we still focus on the <coughs> impacts of uh, globalization and nationalism on democracy and not on the general world order, war and peace, etc., etc. So uh, uh, let's start. Yes. Alexander, you made a good point in the beginning that uh, nationalism and uh, globalism, um, they are modern creations. Mm, maybe you did not exactly see it. What, what did mm. you say? Modern creation. Modern, modern creation. Modern creation. Modern creation. Mm. You said that globalism is something new, and nationalism is something old? I said different. 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 Yeah, sure. Globalism is older. Mm. Older. Sure. Nationalism sure. is new. Sure. Okay. Mm. I agree with you. Uh, I half agree with you because I argue that. Both globalism and nationalism, they are modern contemporary phenomena. Nationalism is something modern because nationalism, nations as collective identities, created by modern states. Before 16th century, we had no nations. Just like we had no states. Modern states emerged in modern period from 15th century onwards, then they created states. I mean, you mentioned uh, Benedict Anderson um, in his book, Imagined Communities, um, nation state um, created a collectivity um, imagined in the sense that uh, remote people they imagine themselves as a unity of collectivity. A man living in, in northeastern Turkey, in the city of Riza, now imagine himself um, as the fellow of men living in northwestern Turkey, Aleppo, Edirne. He will never see that person in his life, and his day life has nothing to do with person living in Edirne, but he is in his daily life, in his habits, very much similar to men living in Batumi. You see, this is imagined community. And this is something we had in the last hundred years. It did not exist in the past. So nations and states, they are modern creations. Mm, of course, mm, peoples existed before. Peoples existed. But nationalism is something very, very modern. Um, usually it is said that it emerged after the French Revolution. Um, globalism, um, it is a, uh, again a modern um, creation with the Enlightenment and present day uh, profits of globalism, Fukuyama mentioned yesterday. But as a process, as a phenomena, global movements, global operations existed from the time immemorial. Perhaps the first global movement was initiated in history when horse tamed by those tribes living around a Caucasian basis. So global movements, global phenomena is something as globalism is something else, we need to distinguish them. Nations, as peoples, they may have existed in the past, but nation as a political community is something modern, <coughs> and nationalism as an idea, as an ideology is something modern. So nationalism and globalism, sorry, they are ideologies. And I finish, both of them are against democracy. Nationalism and globalism, they damage democracy. Why? Because they create, they impose uniformity. Democracy requires diversity. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so, <coughs> okay. Uh, in economic development literature, uh, it might be wrong, but globalization is taken as the free movement of money, people, and goods. Money, people, and goods. Actually, money and goods are circulating freely, but people are not. That's why uh, all the bad things are attributed to globalization. It is taken as the misuse of 
uh, the power of big corporations and rich club countries. So they make a difference between internationalization and globalization. And internationalization is something good, the spread of democracy, the spread of women's rights, and etc. So if we use, perhaps it is better to use internationalization, uh, not to take it as a negative thing. And if we can manage to combine technology, the previous session's discussion, and common language, uh, not necessarily my ideas are true, but uh, English is taken as a universal language. We need to communicate by using a common language. So an information technology, I believe, <coughs> will flat, make the world flatter because without knowing each other, the end of geography, we can combine, instead of competing with each other, we can complete each other, sharing economy, and creating a social pressure on national leaders. How we can do this, Jerome kept saying that let's have a concrete design of international order, what we can suggest. I suggest it could be utopic, but we can start from somewhere. We may choose someone like ombudsman through Drake, like ancient Greek cities, Drake uh, vote through information technologies, and then uh, can determine our common problems and solutions for them, perhaps by organizing different workshops around the world. Uh, Doctors Without Borders and some other non-governmental organizations are good examples. We may manage to do this and can prepare a manifesto. And international information technologies, within a minute, we observe what is going on in Nepal, in Nigeria, and then we can create a, a serious pressure on these kind of uh, problems. You know, um, the hospitals in Chicago, they send through voicemail all the reports of their patients to India because of the time difference. When the hospitals are open, all the electronic forms are coming back with, filled with white uh, things, and also X-ray uh, scanning uh, of patients. The reports are written in New Zealand to American patients. So this means that uh, not necessarily if we don't have physical connection without knowing each other, we can combine the powers of individuals, which is the third globalization. First, after the Second World War, countries came together. And then companies came together. You see, this is an American company. It is not. It is owned by Qatar uh, Emirates. So then com uh, companies came together. Now it is time for individuals to come together and information technologies and common language. We may teach. And people <coughs> in Nigeria, I can send the best Harvard professor to Nigeria physically, but they can have an access to this content if they can use information technology and English. They may watch massive open online courses free in everywhere. So it will make the world more flatter. Okay, so I am optimistic and we can design an utopic <coughs> international order together. Thank you very much. Yeah. What is brightest idea? Oh, it is evident that Western democracy is expanding globally, but not because of its moral superiority. As you know, military intervention is now the standard origin of democratic political system <coughs> undertaken to bring freedom worldwide. This global intervention as the practice of gross <coughs> violation of the international legal order and obligation of the role of the UN began with the NATO bombing of Serbia and Montenegro in 1999. The aggression included 19 European states. It lasted for three months, day and night, and the resulting damage was about 30 trillion dollars. All that was in the name of democracy. Subsequently, this model of inter intervention has been applied by the United States and its allies in Afghanistan in 2001, in Iraq in 2003, in Libya in 2011, and in Syria in 2011 too. There are opinions that Western democratic states consider themselves morally superior because they know how to successfully implement uh, the rule of the people. 
This mythology is sometimes connected to a belief that the Western civilization is superior, extending from Plato to NATO. <laughs> <laughs> the war in Iran, undertaken by NATO in 2003, which more than 500,000 Iraqis were killed, is the clear uh, evidence how bloody democratization can be. Let me remind you that the war in Syria is still going on. It was undertaken to bring democracy. The war is local, but the consequences are global. One of them is the way of immigration towards Europe, which will definitely influence seriously the future of the European Union. We already see that. Thank you very much. That has been just a, moment, a practical contribution to the discussion, which has been, to a large extent, theoretical. This is practice. Democracy in practice on the global level. Thank, Thank you. you. John. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to talk about uh, trying to, uh, to bring some coherence to the, um, to the, to the discussion if we can. Um, you, you started, Alexander, by talking about populism. And populism, it seems to me, is really a symptom. It's not a, a cause. Um, the, the, the cause, uh, to my mind, in a nutshell, is globalization, and, and it's specifically the, the free movement of capital, which was kicked off by Thatcher and Reagan in the 1980s with the big bang of financial market regulation. From that point on, capital could move freely and globally. Now, every nation to have a successful economy needs that capital, mm -hmm. right? It's all up there, so nations now have to compete to attract that capital. Mm -hmm. They have to stay internationally competitive. What does that mean? It means for every country, we have to be attractive to business. We have to be attractive to whatever is globally mobile, like multinational corporations, uh, so we have to privatize, we have to make a, a, a national economy conducive to business needs. So the, the, the net result of that, seen through the different uh, circumstances of each country, will generally be that the, the rich and the corporations will win, the globally mobile entities will win, and the nationally rooted entities, like the middle classes and the poor, and the environment, and national governments themselves, will lose. Okay, so now in political terms, what is the consequence of that? The consequence is that whoever we elect, you can elect the left, the right, the center, whoever gets into power, they still have to keep their national economies internationally competitive, which is why the, the left-wing governments tend to become free market, and, and even the right-wing governments are still free market. <laughs> And, and they're squeezed into the straitjacket. So the consequences for democracy, I would say, I, I would call pseudo-democracy. Like I said yesterday, it's a kind of Henry Ford democracy. You can have any color you want, so long as it's black. And that's why people are becoming fed up. And that's why you get populism. Thank you very much. Thank you. What is populism and why it is so dangerous? Populism is not an ideology. It's social-political uh, reaction to the events that are happening in the world. Populism undermines pluralism, and pluralism is the basis of a democratic society. And uh, in fact, if in the past, and usually we're talking about past populism, which were just vague ideas, and then a politician came and rolled on these ideas. Today, it's different. Politicians in different parts of the world, they create populistic reaction by combining different ideologies. There we have Macron. You cannot say he's a left or right. He combines both ideas. If you will take to any country where we will have populism, I, can, I do not have time to describe and to go to the tent, you will see that in Poland, in Russia, all this populistic way was a political construct of the elites, in fact. And that's what makes it very dangerous, because unleashing this wave 
elites do not have a possibility to respond to this wave within the framework of the existing, let me say, rules of the system. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, Thomas, please. I think I totally agree with you that populist uh, nationalism is a kind of weaponization of, 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 of uh, elites. Uh, can, can you speak louder? Yes, Thomas, because I, I, could not, I could not grasp your meaning. <laughs> <laughs> Emil, I should say, uh, sorry, uh, Alexander, uh, I think you're right that the, uh, the, the dissatisfaction that people feel uh, as a consequence of the impact of neoliberal policies has been recognized by other elites in order to hasten the transition to a further deterioration of democracy. That's very dangerous. That's the real danger, as I see. But on the other hand, in order to diffuse that, you have to understand what drives nationalist and ethno-nationalist sentiment. I work in Indonesia. I'm an anthropologist. The signs of the local and the comparison of, of different localities which gives, leads it directly to the idea of diversity. Okay. So I ought to understand, I've intensively studied social movements at the local level that res respond to globalization impacts. So, and we have a whole category of phenomena called localization, which is a, it's actually an interactive process, it's not one way, it's not just globalization impacts, but it's responses. And generally what these movements are ask, asking for is not isolation or going back to the Stone Age or to tradition, but they want uh, the, the ability to decide themselves which direction forward they take. And the other thing is that you cannot uh, just have a global solution to today's problems. Take sustainability, biodiversity protection, whatever it is. Uh, you have to actually have locally tailored responses. You cannot have one solution to fix everybody's problems. There may be some commonalities, but you have to have local solutions, local action. And that's why diversity is also a very practical necessity. And of course, people like to be uh, localized. As much as they like to be cosmopolitan, they like to also have a, a sense of home, some a sense of belonging. Uh, they don't necessarily like to be forced to be mobile in order to find a job. Uh, they don't like uh, necessarily to be in a multicultural society. There's a lot of people who don't like that idea because the problem with multiculturalism is that it actually destroys culture. You know, you basically you have no culture at all, or some kind of strange mishmash. There is no shared values. Uh, people cannot respond to, 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 to elites if they have no shared culture, no shared understanding. So there is, now there was a phase when multiculturalism was held up high, uh, but I think there, there are risks there. People don't like the, 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 the destruction of their whole family structures. At first extended families, now nuclear families being divided by this enforced mobility. You know? Refugees, and it's really enforced mobility. So I think people really like to stay where they are also. They like to be mobile when they want to be, but they don't want to be forced. They don't want to be inundated. And so, we have to understand those sentiments. We cannot be so rushed, rushed in in uh, judging them. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, the next one, yes, speaker, please. Okay. Uh, thank you, Alex, for uh, your definition of populism. I think that it, 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 in general, I mean, I am thinking in the same uh, direction. Uh, but I'd like to uh, respond to a few issues. I mean, the first one you raised uh, in, your, uh, in your introductory comments, uh, the issue of certain slogans, certain buzzwords, it's not big okay. bad words. No, 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 I mean, no, 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 you <laughs> raising from knees, you know, or, you know, I mean, another one, country in ruins. 
It's amazing that these slogans appear in most of these countries, you know. Kaczynski is in Poland, all one in, in, in and, and, uh, and um, our current uh, 45, 45th president, I don't want to mention his name. So, I mean, this is the, the globalization, is that the coincidence, or maybe this is the work of the Cambridge uh, uh, analytic and, uh, and uh, advisors. We know that, that uh, Kaczynski is an American advisor, you know, and then. Uh, but uh, I mean, this is this is the issue uh, that maybe the the threats are uh, globalizing. And uh, uh, to your uh, comment about diversity, that the globalization is killing uh, diversity. Yes and no. You know, I mean, if you look, uh, the diversity is the source of sustainability. I agree with you. If you look at Switzerland. <laughs> You know, they came together to protect really the national diversity. They use four languages. Three of them are obliged to learn in the school and so on. The respect, you know, this stuff, which is the great case. But, you know, I mentioned Costa Rica, you know, and then you observe what's going on. Introduction multiculture, including, you know, gender equality. I mean, raised the uh, riots, you know, because of strong intervention of Catholic, Protestant, and different churches. And so the country is, is getting divided. It's not that deep. I mean, I know they will find uh, uh, the solution. But anyway, so, I mean, this I, the, the gender inequality is type of global issue, global value. You see, and the, the same you see in the Brexit, you know. I mean, you mentioned that uh, Brexit Maybe this is the uh, way to support globalization, uh, uh, getting out of European Union uh, frames. Yes and no, because I mean the, 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 the um, globalization brought uh, Polish and the other immigrants to England. Polish became the second language there. And for these local communities, it's very strange. They changed the, the environment. Uh, the, in the, uh, Pubs, they speak Polish, you know, they want, uh, they send kids to the, the uh, schools. And so people are not familiar and feel threatened. So the issue is, uh, what, what is the next point, the, the major uh, strategy? And this is what we did not discuss enough. The populist uh, use emotion, use threats as the way to manipulate people, to scare them, to feel unsecure, and then it's easy. If you feel unsecure, you give up your rights, you know, for security, which is false. As you mentioned, you know, that the Poles were manipulated against Muslims, even there are no Muslims. And I mean, the past were also the same, you know, the fire away from anti-Semitic was raised in Poland, even within the Jews, you know. So, I mean, this is the same populist, you know, theory to to, to raise the fear, and then if people are scared, are secure, you can manipulate and them. It's it's thank, you, thank, thank you, you very much. Who is the next one? Yes, uh, please. You called us, you know, with uh, giving an uh, example of Poland. And I would like to point out that uh, Poland uh, was one of the earliest democracies in Europe. Our first uh, constitution was the 3rd of May, 1791, four days before the American constitution. But the misfortune was that we were encircled by empires, uh, Russia and Dismembered Russia and Austria. Uh, so that's why uh, <coughs> we had uh, our lesson. Uh, and uh, the impact uh, of uh, this partition of Poland uh, for uh, 123 years created a differentiation of cultures. So we are not a homogeneous country. We are not re reacting you know, uh, homogeneously to diverse uh, uh, incentives. Uh, and uh, there was a shock for all our um, uh, nation, uh, the election of 2015. Uh, but we didn't understand how it could happen. Uh, because the economic situation was uh, pretty good. Uh, belonging to the European Union gave us a sort of comfort and, uh, and uh, hope for a better future and, and, and perspectives. Uh, uh, belonging to NATO, a uh, feeling uh, at least of uh, security. And then you had a populist uh, nationalist, Kaczynski, who was a frustrated uh, brother of, um, of, uh, of Lech. And uh, with his revenge and his uh, 
So his psychical problems uh, after the death of the, uh, after, after the Smolensk catastrophe, and the, he made this religion of, uh, yeah. of, of, of the Smolensk catastrophe that united a lot of people. But there was a, a there was a study by two uh, sociologists uh, who went uh, into depth with the, with the real situation. How comes that uh, so many people supported uh, uh, law and justice party uh, during uh, during this election? And unfortunately, there were deeper roots uh, of uh, such uh, behaviors. I, I wonder if I have uh, <laughs> space uh, here for uh, for uh, translating that. But if we divide the society into three groups, the lower class uh, had no uh, transfer to the upper class due to the hard work and not having the higher education certificates. Without that, they, they could not attain a higher position, so they were lacking dignity. So, so despite of the income level. Thank you, Virginia. I want only one small comment only. There's so many comments regarding populism and uh, nationalism here, but nobody mentioned um, how many people have died besides Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan and in our neighborhood. Ukraine is the example right now, or Chechnya. Half a million people died last 20 years in Chechnya. Half a million, you can imagine. Yeah. And nobody talks about this. Half a million, whole population of Chechnya. Yes, From 2000 to 2000. to globalization. I mean, I'm, um, I'm sure you're right. But. I mean, uh, so why why Americans went to Afghanistan and, uh, and well, Iraq? Why is it relevant to this discussion? And the same relevance here, because of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, power and then populism. It was the populists who actually tracked it down to Chechens and take them all of them. Because, because why Putin came into power? Yeah. And how could you came to power? Just to pick up on Thomas's comment about multicultural communities, of which Britain is definitely one, so also is France. I think if peaceful coexistence is to obtain in these societies, which are multicultural, that could only be through, um, if it's to be sustainable, what I would call a metaculture, which doesn't deny the individual cultures, but which is something else. And you have. An example of this in France, where you have la culture de la, de la laïcité, secular culture, which is supposed to be something which everybody can buy into while retaining their own ethnic or religious identities. Second point, globalization at present is intrinsically antithetical to participative democracy. Participative democracy, as we shall see, requires location. And finally, the only globalized example of what I would call representative democ democracy is the United Nations, if you subtract the Security Council, which is in no way democratic, but many of the law commissions, which I've worked on for about 40 years, are highly democratic, and it is representative democracy, the representatives of national states. Whether they themselves are legitimate representatives is a different matter. <coughs> the United Nations, in most of its committees and commissions, assumes they are given credentials and they are accredited representatives. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is a new nationalism, a new globalism. Today's nationalism is nothing to do with that commission. Today's nationalism accepts human rights, democracy, and everything else. So I'm not going to discuss that in brief. But I think the solution is to the problem. We used to say think globally very locally. It's changed, and I think it's future. Think locally and work globally. Not think globally and work locally. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, what the, the Boisha raised uh, is uh, very important and we need another space to debate. Are democracy committing injustice uh, and bloody one? Of course, yes. But uh, I think uh, you have to do benchmarking uh, with the dictatorship. Otherwise, uh, it's uh, out of the blue, and of course. Also, democracy is uh, something uh, that is a little bit too much vague and up in the air, like uh, uh, also, uh, I think, uh, populism. 
I, I agree with the people that, that this phenomenon always existed. The Peron was a hypocrisy, perhaps. Uh, but uh, today, the tools uh, and the rapid change uh, are bringing us in a new ball game. What remains uh, to uh, be understanding this phenomenon is not only populism, it's not only nationalism, but how democratic leaders, unfortunately, fail to empathize with the fear of the people, of ignorant people, and give them a channel in to better society and to effective tools to deal, and I'm finishing, well, of course, in Bologna, 91% of votes 20 years ago on progressive terms. Nowadays, the right wing and the populists have 70%. What happened? Well, for example, a colleague of mine quit because all the social programs were quit to save money, but at the same time, the community of Bologna decided to give 35,000 euro to every Rom that would buy an apartment and so to become stabilized. Of course, you should help Roma people to be stabilized, but you have to give an apartment also to the Bologna people that are Italian. Otherwise, they turn to the right, of course. So, uh, global civilization is a fact, but uh, po populism is being fed by ineffective democratic politicians. Uh, I, was, uh, I was asked by, by Gary to say a few words about something without you are familiar with, and uh, some, some things that are related to this that we are doing in public Madrid, association of about 100 former democratically elected associates and governments. And uh, we have two projects that are closely related to this. One is that it was uh, established like 11 years ago. It's called Share Society. Basically speaking, it started with a, a, with a, with a problem at that time, that the world is uh, becoming more uh, diverse, but in bigger chaos. And uh, basically speaking, it was about how to promote inclusive and shared society versus segregated and inclusive societies. And we started that 10 years, 11 years ago, having in mind Middle East, Northern Ireland, Balkan, and South Africa. Okay? Today, we see that this is not a project about those four parts of the world. Today, we see that it's a project about Europe, European Union. It's something that is talking about the current state of the art in the United States and other, uh, let's say, stable society. <coughs> Second one was a uh, new generation of democracy. We started it three, four years ago, remember Alex, about that we need some kind of moving forward. And we were talking about, that was before Arab Spring. We were thinking that actually we need to move forward in order to have the democracies being more attractive for non-democratic countries. Now we see that, I mean, the demo democracies, established democracies, have to move forward in order to be attractive for themselves, yeah. not, for, mm -hmm. not for usual suspects. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, having said so, uh, I think we're witnessing something which I call some kind of a global paradox of progress. Uh, since that famous Berlin Wall fell down, today we are four times economically more powerful, because today the GDP of the globe is four times bigger than that time. We are, according to some estimates, three times more powerful in technological sense. When you talk about computers, we are 300,000 times more powerful than at that time. And we talk about the amount of knowledge. Some estimates are showing that the amount of knowledge produced in the last 30 years was as big as the amount of knowledge until that period, since the Stone Age. So if someone asked you, let's say, 30 years ago, and today there are two times more people living in democracy than at that time. So if someone asked you, when Fukuyama wrote the end of history, that in 30 years will be four times richer, three times more technologically powerful, two, two times knowledge-wise, two times more people in democracy. Well, so it's, it's impossible, it can't, it can't go that good. And if that goes that good, we will live in Nirvana time. Today, we have 
60 more walls in between or inside 40 countries. I won't name them all because it's too long. Too long, yes. And probably while they're talking, some, someone new is planning. Now, I'm not talking about the wall in between Mexico and USA. I'm talking about another walls as well. Even that one is the result of prosperity, right, and civilization. So, so having said so, I think that uh, it is very important how we see that, uh, that we need some kind of new progressive partnership in between people, which is shared society, <coughs> sustainable society, planet, which is environment, <coughs> and thirdly is production of profit for their way or economy. So these three things are supposed to be somehow look in a, in, a, in, a, in a coordination because, uh, you know, I mean, Yugoslavia fell apart because nationalism was faster than democracy. Exactly. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. I mean, we could, we, could, we could democratize the country that was yeah. institutionally stable, yeah. Yeah. Uh, economy, you know, we had last, last Prime Minister Ante Marković who said when the Communist Party was falling apart, he said, don't worry, we have a uh, currency Vina. Economy. That was the most prosperous time in economy in, the, in, the, in this region. Yeah. He thought wrongly that economy is enough to save society. Obviously, without economy, I mean, with peace is not everything, but without peace, nothing is possible. Economy is not everything, but economy is not possible. But we need something more, which is social cohesion, which is again democracy versus versus nationalism. And to close the thing, that I think is about education. Just a few words about education. I think it is very important to understand that, uh, I think it was G.H. Walsh who said that 50 years ago, 100 years ago, uh, that uh, civilization is in context, contact, constant race in between education and catastrophe. I think, I think today it's even more alarming. And because we have to transform education per se, because there's no more need to do, deal with education about for knowledge, and education for skills, but more and more importantly, education for character. And then we are coming to the issue. So we need to deal a little bit more with, with education in, in, in context of shifting the focus. And I, I would suggest, I mean, uh, it is just one line from my previous morning session, which I didn't have a chance. Uh, there is excellent letter. Uh, you can find it on Institute of Life. Uh, letter that was called an appeal for a research for more robust and beneficiary intelligence, signed by Bosnia, Musk, Gates, and other guys who are basically saying, I mean, the people who are officially smart and proven to be smart about technology, saying that we are going in the wrong direction. If we don't do something more organized in a way, and I think it's connected to globalization. What do they mean? No. They mean that we have to invest more in what I connect with education, in character, what we will do with artificial intelligence, not how to make it. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So that's the, I'm just making connection between education for character as a purpose. Why do we need all that knowledge? Why do we need all those skills? Yeah. Thank you very much. I would like just to refer to Michael's previous comment when you said that about some artificial stupidity. I think that the biggest problem is not artificial intelligence. Uh, but natural stupidity, humans. <laughs> no? No, I think humans are more in, are less stupid than machines. Uh, yes, okay. are less stupid than machines at the yes, moment, sir, anyway. I wanted to say something. Oh, that's for sure. Capitano. Well, I, in a few minutes, I agree with everyone and I disagree with everyone. So <laughs> I'm <laughs> uh, 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 including myself. Uh, but to start the way, one of the things we didn't pick up, which was uh, how is it that identity is formed and shaped to begin with? Uh, and you have to grapple, which comes to your question, the character. Uh, you're born into a system which is called a we, your family, which is part of a kinship unit, part of a tribe, part of, a, a, and your identity expands along the lines. At some point, your identity is challenged. Maybe it's at the nation state level, maybe it's beyond the nation state level. But, but, but we have to have a, a better sense of that and also the conditions under which personalities are shaped that are more thoughtful, more choice-driven and more democratic 
then those that would end up as authoritarians and, and totalitarians. There's a choice we have to make in terms of character. Yes. Uh, now, at the international level, it is true that the uh, nation state has absorbed a great deal of what counts as the, shall we say, official demand. Uh, but that's challenged. It was challenged at the altar of a massive world war involving millions of victims, okay? And out of that, we came up with a certain promise of global salience. We can't dis discount that. That global salience was the centrality of a human being, not only in the nation state, but globally, okay? So, so, so your individual identity doesn't only count for the nation, it accounts as a global phenomenon. And it's challenged by so many different things that we have to account for. For example, the role of multinational corporations. They drafted a code of conduct for themselves and none of them, refused, uh, none of them agreed to sign on to it. Okay? They didn't want to agree to their own ethical standards. I mean, I'm sorry about that, but that's the way it is. Um, and, and, and we certainly have a massive problem to, to make sure that political economy is accountable to the political process, okay? We can't leave it running a muck there, making wars on its own, mucking things up, and then blaming us for it. So, so I think this question of the formation, development, evolution, and the challenges of identity from the local to the global is one that we still have to grapple with. Thank you very much, Lisa. Would you like to summarize what I got, what I thought I heard from this? Uh, from these. Uh, it seems to me that I'm talking particularly on the theme of populism because I'm convinced by what you said that that is really the, uh, the source, at least for the more mature democracies, at least for them, that's the, the thing that's preoccupying us most. And uh, it seems to me the, the, the fertile ground for populism is rising levels of insecurity uncertainty and the breakdown of a kind of a shared vision of the future where as long as people really thought we were going towards a better world we were not so susceptible to these yeah. accusations the scapegoats which Hitler exploited in World War II and Trump is exploiting today and other, many others as well so it seems to me uh, I agree with the analysis that we've got leaders who are consciously using this to polarize the society. But I'm not sure, and I agree, uh, uh, that a greater education and education in character uh, is absolutely fundamental to bring in an, an, uh, uh, the uh, protection of the society against this. But I don't see that either of those by themselves is going to do it unless we're addressing the fundamental levels, reasons for that uncertainty, which comes back to the whole discussion we've been having for the last three days about neoliberalism, about rising levels of unemployment or inequality, or what the discussion this morning on technology. And I think there are remedies, there are legal remedies to all of these sources of insecurity. Uh, within a democratic society based on rule of law. Uh, and I, those came up. I, I love the discussion this morning on technology because so many of you wanted to emphasize technology is not the problem. It's whether we're going to govern it or it's going to govern us, whether we're going to let it run away. We control many technologies. We control medical technology and yes. how it's used. We control food technology uh, and how it's used. We try to control. Uh, nuclear technology, and even at least we keep it in a little area, and chemical weapons. Uh, it's a question of the mentality, the philosophy, and the commitment of the society to do this. So I think this has been a really rich and thank helpful you. discussion. You thank you. I know thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes, please. Just a, a, a little comment. I, mean, I think that we need to support a little recommendation for political science in okay. that uh, they have to focus on the discrimination of politi politicians from politicians. I think that this is fundamental, because we today we are too many poli uh, politicians and so, <coughs> so a, a few politi real politicians. 
by those in power which channel this indignation of the people to the populistic, populistic reaction. That's what I mean when I would say about populism. We should not forget that politics is always local and democracy is not about who shines on the TV screens. It's about people, mm -hmm. their life and dignity. And the main question today is not the future of globalism. I can just, you know, count anybody. Globalism will continue to exist. The problem today, who can manage the complexity of this new plurilateral world. It's not multilateral anymore. It's plurilateral. That's the biggest issue for the agenda, the democracy agenda as well. And uh, finally, I want to conclude with the uh, phrase that I uh, picked up in one of the old Muslim <coughs> treatises. It was written there that as it is usual for Islam, I am finishing by saying I have my opinion, my colleagues have a different, and only Allah knows who is that. Thank you.